You may recall, if you're old enough, that there were several best-selling books in the 1970s, 1980s, and 90s, and they were about discoveries that had been made in physics, and then in chaos theory, and then complexity studies. And the gist of these discoveries was that the physical world is a lot more interrelated than our modern schooling had supposed. And that's because our schooling and all our systems of knowledge were based on the mechanistic worldview, which holds that a person or an entity is essentially separate and discrete. Two entities, whether they're people or raccoons or pine trees, they can be in some sort of relationship or not. But that doesn't change their internal constitution and the way they function in the world. So that's the mechanistic perspective. The relational perspective is that every entity is surrounded by dynamic interrelationships, and those definitely do affect your inner organ systems and the way you function in the world. Those interrelationships are dynamic because they're in flux. They change in response to subtle perturbations. They're creative, they're unpredictable, they're full of possibilities. And that's the relational perspective. So, Looking back, I think now that maybe those discoveries were too abstract for most people to pay much attention to. And in any event, you could look around and see that our institutions did not change in order to match these new discoveries. I was among the writers who back then were saying, gee, shouldn't we be getting in sync with this more realistic understanding of physical reality? But that didn't happen, and I think the only area in which the relational worldview got a toehold, really, was what was called then alternative medicine, complementary medicine, integral medicine, which eventually and grudgingly was given a small place in the mainstream medical system. But I was waiting for the big transformation across the board. <laughs> it didn't happen. We were into the 2000s then. I was still waiting. In 2007, I was reading the morning paper, and I saw a small article. And this was about a study that had been done on the physical condition of a certain population. And the journalist noted in the study that the researchers had been surprised by the findings. And I was surprised by the findings. But I could see instantly that they were a result of dynamic interrelatedness. So I cut out the article, and I looked up the study online. That was interesting. And I filed it away. And then a few weeks later, I saw another article about a similar surprising discovery that the researchers had not expected in the findings. And then I saw another one, and then another one. So I cut out all these articles, looked up the full study online. After a few years, I had a big pile. And I drew those together in a book in 2011 called Relational Reality. And these are some of those findings. There was a study done of 906 elderly adults. <laughs> um, and it was found that those who had the um, fewer friends or social contacts had a more rapid decline in motor function, including standing, gripping, and balancing. And it was also found in a Swedish study that having a few good friends is a very strong protective factor against elderly people in terms of who's going to develop dementia. The Swedish researchers will tell you it's much more important than sitting in a room alone doing crossword puzzles. So in a different study, people of all ages who were given a test of mental facility and memory, um, if they talked to someone first for 10 minutes, 
either in person or even on the phone, they did better on that test. And it was found that the more social contacts you have, the higher your level of mental functioning. So relationships make us smart, and they keep us smart. But how did we get smart in the first place? The mechanistic perspective is that when you're born, you have a fixed level of intelligence, and that's that. But that's not so. A number of discoveries in recent years have identified relational factors in the family that have a strong effect on the development and the expression of intelligence. And one of those is breastfeeding. It's been found that if you were fortunate enough to be exclusively breastfed for the first year of your life, that added four points to your IQ score. That's been found in a number of tests, most recently a study that was published just three months ago by the Journal of the American Medical Association, their pediatric branch. But it's not just the neurosugars in the breast milk. It's also the hours of intimate relationship between the mother and the nursing child when all kinds of relational information is exchanged by the eye and the voice, touch, other body language, and all that stimulates brain development. And then in a different area, our immune system, the biomechanistic system could never explain why some people catch cold a lot more than others, even if they get enough exercise, enough rest, eat well, take vitamin C. And a study was done at a university where they asked the volunteers to fill out a survey. How many friends and social contacts do you have? How often do you socialize with them? And then they sprayed into the nose of each volunteer a cold virus. And they subsequently found that the people who had said they have a lot of friends were four times less likely to develop a cold after receiving the virus. So, these are all uh, examples of beneficial results from good relationships, but bad relationships have a physical effect on us as well. And last year, there was a study of children and violence. It was found that if children under 10 are exposed to violence, where they're being directly physically assaulted, assaulted and injured, or even just witnessing violence, they then undergo a change in their cells. Their telomeres shorten. That's the part of the cell. It's like a little cap that protects the DNA material during cell division. And the shortening of the telomeres is usually what's seen in aging. And it was also found that the more types of violence the child had been exposed to, the faster the rate of the erosion of the telomeres, shortening their lifespan and compromising their health throughout adulthood. So we are profoundly relational beings with all that entails. But we're not only in relationship with other people. We also have inherent interrelationships with the rest of the natural world. And you may have heard that people who work in daylighted buildings get sick less often. They have a lower absentee rate than people whose workplace has very little natural light. And if you've been in a hospital recently, the odds are good that you've noticed their decor has changed and they've brought in nature motifs. You may have seen leaf patterns on the drapery and sometimes there's a photograph of a big mountain scene directly across from every patient's bed on the wall. Why are they doing this? It's because there's so much evidence that sparking us, reminding us of that interrelationship we have with nature, even through an image, helps our healing process. And then, since we're talking about nature, other species, we should stop a moment here and think about the many species of bacteria that live in us, for the most part, helping our organ systems do what they need to do, you may have seen in the media articles that the field of microbiology has undergone a sea change in the last two years. 
because they always operated on the mechanistic perspective. So they said, if you have a bad bacteria in your intestinal tract or really anywhere in your body, there's nothing to do except go in and kill it with a broad spectrum antibiotic, which had the unfortunate effect of killing your own, your whole microbiota. But what they discovered a few years ago is that the bacteria operate in relationship. And that what was making people ill with Crohn's disease, asthma, allergies, other chronic conditions, was not so much the presence of the bad bacteria, but the lack of the good bacteria that suppresses the effect of the bad one. So the new therapy is to implant the missing good bacteria, and that takes care of the problem. So all these examples are what I call relational physiology, that our physical condition is affected by our relationships. But relational physiology is only one area in which the relational shift is transforming our systems and institutions. It's really moving through so many, education, parenting, in the business world, urban design. But even all those which are focused on the human are not what the essential discovery is about with the relational shift. It's really about our awakening to the fact that the entire physical world, the entire universe, is constituted and operates through dynamic interrelationships, and that we humans are a part of that. We're nestled in this endless field of interrelationships that make us what we are. It's so cozy. <laughs> and moreover, there is a level of pathos in the fact that it's 2013 and we're just now making these very basic discoveries about our own nature. But on the other hand, it's so terrific that the relational shift is rippling through all these fields now. So these discoveries that are driving this transformation, which are very concrete, they're very accessible, they're going to keep coming. And I hope the next time you read about one or hear about one, you'll think to yourself, oh yes, that's another example of the relational shift. In the end, the most important implication for us to take to heart is that the quality of our knowing in any situation depends on the quality of our awareness of the dynamic interrelationships. Nothing exists outside of interrelationship. That's how we're structured, that's how we function, and that is how the world really works. Thank you.